representations by managing all the degradation. So, as most of you are aware, our team way of doing all the analysis is we take an order from uh, somewhere and we ship it, we store it in a bag, and we ship it to an optometric lab, wherever that may be. But um, we have focused a lot on the olfactometry and doing the accuracy of it, and that made sense because it was a more controlled environment. Now there is a trend to look a lot at the sampling and the storage and how we can make sure that the sample we take makes it to the lab properly. So uh, I put this graph as an example. We'll get to the details of it. But in a refinery situation, we have a lot in Canada, and they are away from our labs. <coughs> and all the labs are within the Toronto area. So when you ship something with, for example, benzene in it as a compound, it will not make it to the lab. It will come within an hour or even less than an hour. You lose most of that rolling. So you have to kind of be aware of what you're shipping as well. So there are, <coughs> sorry, uh, same as uh, my uh, previous uh, presentation that we had, that there are four different reasons for having this odor degradation. First is the contamination, which the previous presenter also mentioned, with Teflon and other things. Then is a loss due to the permeability of the material plus the absorption of it. Then there is a contamination, and this is sometimes not really looked at. If you put two <coughs> bags together, or if you store your bags in a van that uh, is smells like uh, from sampling equipment, you will actually absorb some of that odor into a low concentration bag. And this is perhaps more problem in Canada because we also do ambient sampling. And in ambient sampling, the odor levels are low enough that you can contaminate this method. And then there is, of course, uh, losses to just the molecules breaking up within the, within the bag itself over time. So um, the way to manage it, or how can we better manage it, one is to have, of course, proper sampling technique, uh, transportation and management, and we'll go over some of what we do and some of what other people that I've met do in terms of better managing this. And then the other one is through the use of direct olfactometry. So first, I'll start with the background orders. So in the sample bag, uh, what we did is we put the nitrogen in, and after two hours, we made a measurement. The details you can find in the paper, I understand what the conclusion. So here you have uh, samples at 20 degrees stored, and you can see uh, <coughs> about 9 million minutes, um, Tedlar 42 million minutes, and uh, if you precondition Tedlar at animal in the morning, uh, if you put air at 120 degrees Celsius or above and pull it out, you will reduce the odor in Tedlar to about 7 million units or so. But it's a pretty time consuming and energy consuming process. The second one we did was we stored samples at 55 degrees. And why we did is because we have some projects in, uh, in the Middle East and the temperatures can be quite high. So if you have those conditions, sometimes you have, for example, Nelfen. Nelfen at 90 degrees starts to decompose 95 degrees. So at 55 degrees, it starts to give up more odors than it did at 20 degrees. Tedlar and uh, PTFE, well, I forgot to mention PTFE in the previous one. Tedlar and PTFE seem to be more stable at high temperatures. And uh, PTFE has no, I mean, to what we could measure, which is about three older units, there is no uh, orders that we could detect. So the second part is the sample escape, what leaves the sample back. Um, so the material is the main thing for, of course, for this, and uh, we measured Nalofen, Tedlar, and PTFE. Um, PTFE and Tedlar were 50 microns, that's the same as what you have in your uh, tubes that we get. And Nalofen, 25, this is the most common that you get. <coughs> now, PTFE has a higher density than gold, it's about 2.2 grams per cubic centimeter. Tedlar is about half of that, and Nalofen is less. But now is also thinner usually when we use it. So the first one we did was at oil refinery. Uh, the picture uh, so in this one, PTFE performs much, much better. And as I mentioned, for Tedlar and Nalofen, the degradation is very high. So you have to be very careful how long you 
transport this sample if you take it in another can back. The next one we did was at a compost facility. And here you see they're much closer together, like between PTAP and PETLAR. There are analysis differences, but not, not considerable, uh, especially if you're doing analysis within the first six hours. In a wastewater treatment plant, uh, the PTFP and TEDLAR again are, are similar. The PTFP is always performing a little bit better. Um, some of it is for H2S. Uh, we're doing an analytical study as well, which we haven't released it. But the TEDLAR has now been lower, but it's not as significant as was in refinery and certain chemical processes. So the second one I want to talk about is cross-contamination. Now this happens, uh, I'm sure, and not with anybody here, or not too much expertise, but sometimes when labs or samplers don't have expertise, they take the inlet and outlet of, let's say, biofilter and put it in some bag and close it and ship it. When you put bags like this, the entire container will become contaminated, and when you open it, you, you smell it, and it it, especially if it's stored for like six, ten hours and stuff. So then molecules start to go from one to the next. So in this graph, what I'm showing is we start at some older, the low one that we're in 50. And this is the outlet side. And we stored it within the inlet side. And the inlet was in the few thousand. So what you see is the inlet side starting to drop. Uh, but the outlet side is actually starting to rise. So it's getting more holders inside the sample, rather than less as time goes by. And the next one is for sample decomposition. For usually for most compounds like wastewater and things like that, it's kind of manageable. But sometimes, especially with new filter technology like ozone, cold plasma, uh, UV, these create certain molecules that are reacting very fast with the olive. If you have it, okay, in the setup you see the tubes going back and forth, is to give the time for the ozone to react with the olive. When you take the sample, it's still reacting, it's still continuing. But if you didn't take the sample, it would go into the atmosphere and disperse. Reaction would stop. But you want to know what's the dispersed dispersion sample, not what's going to be if you store it for six hours. So in this case, we took from an also generator. And it um, doesn't matter which one you use, PT or PT, now okay? they will all have a sharp drop because the ozone is actually killing whatever is left in the back. So in these cases, it's really important to come up with a, whether direct or back country or a lab that is on site. So uh, every source has a different order degradation. This is my main message I want to say, that you cannot treat all the same. Refineries are not wastewater treatment plants. They should be considered separately when we do sample. Uh, the material should be selected in accordance with what you're doing. If it's a short time holding on a wastewater treatment plant, that one is okay. But if it's a refinery and you're shipping it 3,000 kilometers to Toronto, this is, that one is not okay. Perhaps that one or PTAP is better. Uh, we allow 24 to 30 hours. We will be DDI allows six hours. I think that's a very good way to go in the right direction. But we also should know what is the older losses. Even within six hours, you can have significant more if you have ozone, if you are in treatment of a refinery. So uh, one way that we're doing this, <coughs> and this is used a lot in Canada, is we make direct olfactometry measurements as a quality assurance. So we put the tube, we make measurements, and we say, OK, yeah, this bag is in the 2002 range. There is some uncertainty, of course. It's bigger than what the lab uncertainty is. But at least we have an idea. So when it goes, if it goes from 10,000 to 100 of you, we know what, we know what happened. So the usual method of doing is from every source, a sample is taken and analyzed with the field of accounting before being shipped. Uh, especially for things that are from Vancouver, from uh, across the country where shipment is uh, 4,000 kilometers. Then the lab, when they analyze it, they can determine roughly what the older losses were. Um, now, if you are uh, using some abatement technology, like ozone, then there is no way but to use direct olfactometry or to put your lab in the field. So, in conclusion. Uh, so, if possible, perform before and after shipment measurements using a personal factometer, SM100, and 
and determine what is the sources or the losses. Um, selecting the proper bag for the source and keeping samples. Now, we had some study on this as well, but I didn't include in the presentation. So if your samples are outside during sampling, if once you take it, you put it aside, the UV light will decompose as well the, the sample. So you should keep that out of the way. Uh, air freight, uh, may, maybe you don't use air freight so much in Europe, but we do in Canada a lot. And air freight subjects it to lower pressure and temperature, and this significantly increases all the losses in any of the bags. And uh, of course, going to uh, put different bags of different concentrations in set box. And uh, also, don't fill bags to more than 80% because it pressurizes, especially during air freight, and that can lead to condensation that you didn't account for. And uh, if possible, analyzing less than six hours, if possible, even one hour is better. So, thank you very much. Got time for a quick question? Somebody from the back? Regarding your first conclusion, um, can you show us the conclusions slide? Uh, yes, yes, yes. If you do personal the um, olfactometry before and after shipping, I'm here. Where's it all? It's already done. Okay, if you do personal olfactometry before and after shipping, it's probably not the same person, right? Uh, so it's quite it can, problematic. It can be, uh, so, sometimes it's the same technician. Like, uh, if somebody from your company is going out, they can make a measurement and come back. And you use the same device to do the analysis. If it's not the same person, then you have to allow for that uncertainty. You know, then you're not saying that it's a factor of three is too much older losses, because you might have a factor of two of uncertainty anyway. So then it's like a factor of ten or fifteen that's too much. It's not within the uncertainty. I think it's quite useful to have uh, uh, degradation factors for typical sources. Like in my experience, I mean, we could uh, see typical uh, losses for wastewater treatment uh, facilities, for uh, composting facilities. So maybe, maybe locally, but I mean, you can develop some uh, reduction factors that can be generally used after that. Because if everybody has to make its own reduction factors, maybe it's too much for. Uh, you mean to Yes, 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 if you know the degradation factor. Like if you do a photometry at the time zero and then after 30 hours and you see the loss is, let's say, by a factor of two or three, then you use it like, use it like typical uh, reduction factors. Maybe. I, I don't know if you can make it something that would be universal, saying always for the treatment plants, uh, even if it's by the process, saying from the positive output or from the aeration hang it will always be two or three times. I think it will depend on the process, you know, even within one plant, if the aeration is not working properly and you have more of something, H2X or something else, it might change. So I'm not sure if multiplying it might, might add more error than just saying it is more than 5,000, uh, but we don't know. We had some losses probably in the 30 percentage, but it's anyway, it was more than you know, like, I don't know, maybe I'll have okay. All right, thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> so we have a time. Yeah, uh, you showed a, a number of, uh, of really uh, nice graphs of, uh, of production. Um, and uh, some of those really show about four points uh, between 10%. So that leads me to the expectation that the uncertainty on those points is about 2%. We're used to about 50% if you apply the uh, divided by the square root of n rule. That would mean you've done several hundred replicates on every point. Can you tell us how many samples were taken and with how many uh, panel members for each of these dots on the graph? Especially if you're a factor, if you 
dilution step is not very large. We use usually 1.4 dilution. If you use a dilution step of 2, it adds an extra second. Now, I'm not saying that the trend will be the same. Perhaps there is some error. Maybe this point would be higher or lower. We did it as an average of three. But it doesn't mean that, of course, uh, this one is better than this one. These are pretty close together. But for sure, PTFP is going to be better than these because the, the, the difference is quite large. You go from the 60 to the less than 10. But are you saying these are approximate values, or are they yeah, actually the values and how many replicates and how many? Uh, three replicates. Yes. You replicates with one person. No, 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 no. With one, uh, with two or four. With this study, uh, I think four. No, it's four uh, three times a year, but it's just the average of those three. I must say it's revolutionary policy. For well, it's one, but the, the important thing is the trend of it. It's not important if it's uh, 10, 15, or 17. The important thing is that it's 10, it's not 90. Okay, thank you.